It's great to be speaking at this event hosted by the City of London as part of their Green Horizons Perspective series. The Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero is a core element of our work on private finance for the COP26 Summit in November. It brings together over 160 banks, asset owners, insurers and pension funds, together responsible for assets in excess of $70 trillion from across the globe and I'm pleased to see so many UK-based firms play a leadership role in GFANS. The UK has also made green finance a key priority of this year's G7, making this the first time that climate and the environment have been tabled for substantive discussion in the finance track. I was pleased to secure ambitious agreement on sustainability disclosures, which are very much in line with the COP26 private finance agenda. GFANS will continue to be the place the financial sector meets to progress and accelerate the transition to a net zero economy. And I hope to see many more institutions join GFANS and commit to achieving net zero emissions in the coming months. Ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor to speak at this City of London Green Horizon Perspective event. It's a great pleasure to also to work with a leader like Mark as a peer UN special envoy to promote innovative approaches in finance and investments, which are essential in transforming our economy to a sustainable one and achieving the sustainable development goals. Ever since I started working on sustainability as CIO of GPIF by promoting ESG integration in a portfolio management, I soon realized some fundamental issues were undermining ESG integration effort. GFUNDS, an alliance that brings together leading net zero initiatives across the financial system, will certainly help us overcome some of these issues. The first issue GFUNDS could address is a lack of market consensus on the base case climate scenario. Financial analysts and fund managers still struggle to agree on a base case to use for their analysis. I previously discussed with the corporate and financial leaders about that. All agreed that it is necessary and possible to achieve net zero by 2050. However, they didn't all agree on whether it will actually happen. Collaborative pledge by leading financial institutions would imply that they will set their base case in alignment with the 2050 net zero scenario. Then all investments would be priced relative to that scenario. The G funds will send a signal loud and clear to all the participants of global financial markets. The second issue is interdependence of financial markets and players. Each player will affect the actions of others. Investors cannot invest in a project which is not bankable. Banks cannot finance a project which is not insured. Asset manager cannot invest in a portfolio which their clients refuse. Insurance company cannot invest their capital reserve in a financial product that are not rated by credit rating agencies. We need all actors in a financial market to work together. G funds promotes more collaboration between different players of the financial markets. The third issue is inequity between regions. G funds will not only bring together the players from different sectors, but also from different geographic regions. There is only one planet and a climate change will not respect any political or commercial boundaries. So it is critical that institutions from developed countries assist institutions in less developed countries with less capital adequacy and human resources. Institutions from developed countries will need to finance or invest more aggressively in net zero or negative carbon technologies and support those less resource institutions with their innovative finance know-how and sustainable investment products. Once again, I would like to thank Mark and the City of London for giving me this opportunity. I respect London's innovation and leadership in finance and its track record of having effectively allocated capital for business to speed up innovations and deliver prosperities. The UK also led with their innovative finance regulations. The UK's origin, stewardship and corporate governance codes are now used as a practical tool by foreign regulators 
to promote sustainability and a corporate governance. Japan recently revised their corporate governance code to make the TCFD disclosure effectively mandatory using a comply or explain framework. The London Stock Exchange led the development of a sustainable bond market and ESG index, etc. I have the highest expectation for you to continue to do that until we achieve our common goals for a sustainable and inclusive world and prosperity for all. 2021 will be remembered as historic year, a year in which we either did or didn't fail our children. Let's take actions. Okay, thank you very much uh, to the Chancellor and to uh, Special Envoy Hiro Mizuno for those opening remarks. Uh, I'd like to thank all of you uh, in the audience uh, for taking the time to join us today. Uh, you know, one of uh, the key uh, deliverables uh, of COP26 is a private financial sector that takes climate change into account in every decision. Uh, that finances the innovation and the investment of the private sector on the road to net zero. Uh, and uh, I can't say enough about the leadership role of UK financial institutions uh, in making uh, that happen. Um, there has been tremendous progress. Uh, you've heard about GFENS uh, and the commitments there. Uh, what the focus of the next uh, just under half hour is going to be uh, about how we shift uh, the focus from commitments uh, towards action, uh, because we all know that we need to su significantly scale up uh, efforts uh, to translate uh, those commitments, so the commitments of balance sheets, uh, to uh, uh, to f finance the investments uh, that are necessary for net zero. Um, and I can't think of a, a better group uh, to convene, um, uh, because these are all action-oriented uh, CEOs who've uh, demonstrated uh, this throughout their careers uh, and, and around these, uh, these issues in uh, recent years and uh, indeed months. Uh, so I'll just briefly introduce uh, uh, each of them and then go directly into the questions so we can actually move uh, to action, as I said. Um, we're honored. We have uh, Joe Garner, who is uh, the Chief Executive of Nationwide uh, Building Society, Allison Rose, the Chief Executive of NatWest Group, uh, Bill Winters, who's the Group Chief Executive of Standard Charter, and Jess Daly, uh, the Group uh, Chief Executive of uh, Barclays. Um, and uh, with their agreement, and uh, it's too late now because I'm, I guess I'm modern, modern, <laughs> moderating this, uh, I'm going to go directly into the questions uh, and, um, and, and with the, the theme of how do we uh, turn commitments into actions. Um, and Joe, I, I want to start with you. Uh, nationwide unique position is uh, the UK's largest mutual and, uh, and the second largest mortgage provider uh, in the country, uh, you know, essential role. I know from my past experience, essential role uh, in the UK economy and touching uh, households up and down uh, the country. Um, what role uh, do you see um, for Nationwide in helping to drive the transition uh, to a lower carbon future? Um, and, you know, given that unique position of uh, the UK's leading mutual and uh, mortgage provider, uh, how does this relate to, uh, to that role? Thank you. Well, we very much see our role as around housing. Uh, Nationwide is not a bank. We're not a corporate. We're not a company. We are a society founded by, in 1884 to help our members uh, help improve living conditions for what our founders called the industrious classes. And um, for much of the 19th century, that was about helping people build their homes. In the 20th century, it was about helping people buy their homes. And I believe in the 21st century, it's going to be about helping people green their homes. And I think that if our founders were alive today, they would very much have seen the greening of housing as being core to our purpose. Because although we have a balance sheet of you know, above a, a quarter of a trillion pounds today, we remain guided by that core social purpose. And that's why we're really pleased to be announcing today that we are signing up to the Net Zero Banking Alliance and GFANS with that and really keen to play a leading role. We, we had already announced a billion pound funding to help our members with the greening of their homes. We already got our own operations to carbon neutrality around a, a year ago. 
were actually financing the construction of a development in Swindon and pioneering uh, on the, across the whole housing development, 250 houses, all EPC rate, A rated uh, homes. Um, and you know, we would really like to play a, 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 an influencing role in helping shape the, the policies for the next chapter and, and, and our role very, very much, very strongly within uh, GFANS in doing that. But it's gonna to be tough. It's going to be really tough to tackle this. Housing making up 15, 1.5% of carbon emissions um, and a huge amount of work to be, to be done. But I would finish on an optimistic note um, despite or actually because of the pandemic and the enforced savings and, and government support, consumers have amassed around 200 billion pounds of incremental savings. And perhaps more importantly, we've detected a real shift in, in attitude of consumers. The kind of live for today mentality that was dominant before the pandemic has receded. And we're seeing um, our members thinking much more long term and so there's a real opportunity in how consumers choose to spend and invest some of that money. And we perceive the opportunity to help ensure that uh, a significant portion of that is directed towards the greening of the economy in general and housing in particular. OK, great. Thank you very much, Joe. That's uh, really exciting, the, the commitment to uh, Net Zero Banking Alliance and uh, the sense of social purpose and that, that being echoed by your uh, by your customers and also welcome the, uh, you know, the, the very frank admission of how difficult uh, this is. And I think that's one of the things as we translate uh, into action is uh, is the scale of the challenges. And it's sort of in that spirit, uh, <laughs> you have a difficult job. You've turned to Alison Rose. And so, Alison, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn to you as well, given your uh, position, NatWest's uh, position in terms of uh, uh, you know, again, a leading mortgage provider, but also uh, the you know major uh, financier of uh, small, medium-sized enterprises uh, up and down the United Kingdom, amongst many other things that NatWest does, uh, but absolutely essential there. Uh, and you know, you've uh, been a leading advocate over time, uh, and you've put those uh, that advocacy into actions. You have one of the most aggressive decarbonization uh, uh, targets, certainly by 2030, uh, as well. So. Uh, I, I guess I'll ask you, uh, given that perspective, how best do you see that the financial sector can support uh, this real economy transition uh, to net zero and, uh, and, and, some, uh, and some perspective on uh, how NatWest is uh, putting that into action? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Mark. And look, I, I think the main point here is the transition to, to net zero is um, an important step, but decarbonizing the whole economy is going to require massive collaboration, coordination um, across public and private sector and as working together. There isn't um, one organization that's going to be able to uh, address this on their own. And so I think it's really important that we, we set targets, but also unlock um, the financing that is available to fund this transition and drive real decarbonization. And I think, the you know, to echo a, a couple of points that Joe made there, I think the transition is something that can be really positive, obviously really positive for um, the planet, but very significantly in job creation, in creating new technologies and new innovation and unlocking the trillions of dollars that um, exist around the world in asset managers, in banks, to really fund and finance this transition. But I think what's really critical is we need to move in away from the theory and into action and what are the practical steps that need to be taken to support this. And this is where the collaboration and support is going to be so critical and where GFANS, I think bringing all of that insight, data and information together is so important. From our perspective, what we see with our customer base is a real desire for data and information. I think the case for um, climate change and climate action is very, very clear, but understanding where you are on the journey and how to get there are, are two very different things. And so accessing data and information, and I know, um, you know the other people on the panel will talk about this a little bit, is, is going to be critical. From a small business perspective, and we're obviously the largest lender to small business in the UK, we know that 88% of businesses want to decarbonize their supply chain. How to do that and having the tools to do that and the best practice to do that is something that we need to practically put help in their hands to do that. So from our perspective at NatWest, I think firstly, you know, I've approached it in a number of different ways. Firstly, getting my own house in order. So 
we are already at net zero. We intend to be net positive. And we've also put our climate targets in our executive remuneration plan. So this is very clearly linked to our strategy. Secondly, it is about ending harmful activities and financing the transition to a low carbon economy. If we just withdraw financing from the most harmful areas or from parts of the economy that are unable to fund the transition, we will create massive dislocation in regional and global economies. So for me, the focus is about the practical steps. So when it comes to small businesses, we're working in partnership with companies like Microsoft to develop tools to help SMEs to measure their carbon footprint and put tools in their hands to help them understand their supply chain and transition. We're working in partnership with Octopus Energy to put in the hands of the retail customers and the consumers a way to understand and finance and move to electric cars. And our future mobility group is working cross industry, cross sector to help support um, taking carbon out of the transport industry. We're also supporting entrepreneurs by holding 25% of our free accelerator hubs for climate and sustainability related businesses. So all of these steps are about practical support, but fundamentally we've set a target to halve the impact of the financing on um, the climate emissions of our financing and our balance sheet. And that's going to need real practical support. And the sooner we can all get into sharing best practice and funding the transition. And again, this is where I think it's a really exciting opportunity. We, we have set a 20 billion target by 2022 for renewable energy financing. We've already hit 12 billion, we'll beat that target this year. And that's about really putting the money to fund the transition. And that's where I think this group and the groups you've brought together in GFANS are gonna be able to unlock the opportunity. But we have to make sure we're not staying at the theory, we're staying at the practical and really putting tools in the help of the whole economy. That's great. That's great. And I, I'll just really reemphasize, um, you know, the value of coming together. And as you just said, Alison, sharing best practice amongst financial institutions, but also setting expectations amongst uh, the clients of your clients, clients of financial institutions in terms of data and information, what's useful, and also helping to draw that out and particularly across the supply chain. Uh, and that, that awareness is increasingly there. It, you talked about incentive alignment for executive compensation. This is also about alignment across the uh, supply chain and it starts with data. And you know, the fact is uh, they're, 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 we're missing some data. We're also missing some markets, which brings me to my last, my, my next uh, uh, topic. We are missing uh, a, a huge market, which is a, a truly professional market for uh, carbon offsets, uh, a market that can be um, catalytic for new technologies. Uh, it can provide co-benefits for nature. Uh, it absolutely, uh, in my judgment, and I think shared by many others, uh, is essential uh, to preserve and uh, maximize our carbon budget uh, so that uh, we can get to net zero uh, in, a, in a timely and effective fashion. And uh, Bill Winters, um, uh, not content with uh, the full-time responsibilities of being CEO of Standard Chartered, uh, you have uh, you've taken on uh, enormous responsibilities, and uh, I thank you for this in terms of helping to set up uh, uh, running the task force for scaling voluntary carbon markets. Uh, for those who are not close to this, uh, I just want to underscore just how enormous uh, this task is. Uh, more than 250 organizations involved in the process from across the financial sector, NGOs, uh, broader stakeholders. Uh, and really, uh, Bill, I uh, want to just ask you, how, how's it going? Uh, where does it stand and what should we expect uh, from, uh, from the task force in the, in the months and years ahead? Well, uh, thanks very much, Mark, for having me. It's great to be here and talking about this. Uh, and I, I, I will talk about the voluntary carbon markets and the task force in particular, but uh, maybe picking up on, on some of what Joe and, and Allison have, have already said, uh, we, we do have to go back to, to the basics first, I think is, uh, and we've been very clear in, in, in the task force for scaling voluntary carbon markets about our hierarchy. Number one on the hierarchy is we almost do everything that we can to reduce our own emissions. And for banks, of course, that means in, in, incrementally and importantly, uh, reducing the, the the portion of our clients' emissions uh, for which we're taking responsibility, no no small task and uh, and, and technically quite complicated. Uh, the, the way that we've approached that at Standard Chartered has, has been to, of course, make our own commitments around uh, our operational uh, emissions. And uh, while, while while we are not uh, carbon positive yet, Allison, uh, you you give us something very clear to shoot for. We certainly intend to be 
uh, to, re to reducing our emissions to zero by 2030. Uh, and we'll look for ways to accelerate that. The, uh, the, 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 the much more complicated part, though, is our finance emissions. So over 95% of, of our emissions are coming from, from our clients. And uh, I know Jess, no doubt, will speak about this as well. Jess and, and Barclays and, 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 and I think all of us have been doing a lot of work to define uh, and understand uh, what we take responsibility for, and then maybe much more relevantly for each of us, what we can do to work with our clients to help them reduce their emissions. And uh, Allison made references to, to substantial financial commitments. Uh, Senator Chartered uh, has made similar commitments in our markets. Uh, as, as some of you know, Senator Chartered operates, uh, uh, f for the most part, across emerging markets, so uh, across Asia, the Middle East, and Africa, as well as serving our, our U.S. and European clients, uh, but, but with, a, with a, a slant towards those uh, developing economies. Uh, unlike uh, many places in the U.S., Europe, and the U.K., uh, the level of commitment at the government uh, level is not the same. Uh, it's it's the either unspecified or non-specified, uh, and that uh, that presents some some challenges for all of us. Uh, when we look at the magnitude of financing that's required uh, in in the world to to achieve this transition to net zero, and we're talking about you know, something like three trillion dollars per year uh, for the foreseeable future. Maybe 60 or 70 percent of that financing is likely to be available in the developed world, uh, and Allison spoke to that. Uh, we're doing our part, Barclays is, as well as uh, I think uh, many others, including now a burgeoning asset management sector. Uh, in the developing world, uh, I'm afraid that we have line of sight only in about 10 percent of the of the the financing that will be necessary to fund this transition to a net zero economy. Uh, that calls for a, a fundamental rethink about the way that that money is moving. From the, uh, the 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 let's call it the wealthy pockets uh, into the pockets of people that that actually can have the biggest impact in terms of reducing global emissions. Uh, a lot of the research that we've done points to the fact that a a renewable project in India has about seven times the impact of a renewable power project in Europe. Why? Because you're replacing in many cases the dirtiest uh, coal-fired power plants. Whereas in Europe, the, the existing energy stock is already much, much, much cleaner. So we've got to find a way to to, to direct uh, funds into the developing world. Now to the to the task force for, for scaling voluntary carbon markets. The one of the conduits for for moving this money is to have a a, a good, robust process, robust process for identifying those projects which are of the highest quality, uh, absolutely credible, and where all of us who are making net zero commitments can be confident that if we invest in those projects. Uh, that we're going to be both doing the right thing, but also recognized for doing the right thing. And that's a critical thing that's been lacking in the voluntary carbon markets for the past couple of decades, really. Uh, many of the credits that have been created and traded and, and, and purchased by, uh, by emitters, and including uh, all of us on this call, are, are absolutely of a high quality. But unfortunately, many aren't. And, and it's hard to tell the difference between one and another. So what we set out to do with the task force is, number one, to, uh, to, to set an agreed high level of standard uh, that qualifies as, as a core carbon contract. Uh, number two, to put a governance framework in place that will uh, allow these core carbon principles to be cur curated over time. Technology will change, you know, understandings will change, science may change in some cases. Uh, and we'll want to continually evolve that, uh, that, that framework for overseeing the, the uh, quality assurance in that market. And we'll want to make sure that, that the, this, this, the, the governance structure that we put in place uh, both stands the test of time, but also is successful in promoting what we really need to get done, which is to move billions, eventually tens of billions of dollars from the hands of people who can't reduce their emissions to zero by themselves. These hard to abate emissions, uh, or in some cases impossible to abate emissions, but rather use the offset market to channel some of our funds into those projects, uh, whether they're nature-based projects or technology-based projects that really can reduce the emissions in the environment or outright remove carbon from the environment. So those are the two key strands of the task force. Uh, we've had a consultation process which which completed about a week ago. Uh, a fantastic response. We got about 200 responses from, from different uh, participants outside of the task force, in addition, of course, to the 250 corporate members, 450 individual members overall who have, who have been shaping this process. Uh, we'll produce our final report on July 8th, where we make very specific recommendations about uh, the, the standards that we propose around the, the governance framework that we propose, around the underlying infrastructure and legal contract uh, framework that, that we propose. Uh, we'll then uh, seek to constitute this governance body in a, in a formal way and uh, be, be off to the races, hopefully a mark in time for, uh, for COP26, 
uh, where I know you've got a, a very rich agenda of which this is just one part. But if we get this right, uh, and, and if we get the, 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 the hierarchy right, reduce first, report along the way, and then offset or, or compensate, uh, we, uh, we have a fighting chance of, of tackling this problem that we've all set our sights on. But thanks. Yeah, that's um, that's excellent uh, and uh, and very encouraging in terms of the the progress that's been made um, and the and, and the comprehensive approach uh, that is is being taken here. Um, I wonder, um, Jess, if I if I can turn to you because uh, Bill uh, referenced uh, shareholder engagement and stakeholder engagement and. You know, I was struck, uh, you know, this, but uh, uh, would have been about 18 months or so ago, uh, you know, some shareholder engagement with Barclays uh, on, a, on a specific issue, on, on a subset of issue, important issue in terms of uh, elements of the financing book. Uh, and your response uh, was comprehensive, uh, it was a comprehensive strategy. And I, 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 I make that observation because that was also early uh, relative, you know, it, when people look back, they can say, well, yes, others have followed in that, but uh, it was early and, uh, and to your and, uh, and the board's credit. Uh, I, but I'll, I'll ask, so I'll just make that observation, but then I'll ask the general question in terms of uh, your approach, uh, your approach to these issues, and including with uh, shareholder and stakeholder engagement. Thanks, Mark, and I uh, appreciate the invitation to join this group and uh, would say it's great to be on a panel with Joe and Allison and Bill, and, uh, uh, and I do think that the British financial industry um, is every day demonstrating that it's shoulder to shoulder with the UK government uh, um, uh, with the objective of, of making the United Kingdom uh, one of the leaders in dealing with the climate uh, challenge. So it's uh, uh, great to be with us partners. I would also add that I think one of the most important challenges and opportunities for us is what Bill's uh, focusing on. In terms of this carbon credit issue, it's incredibly complex, and great to see him in the forefront of of that. Um, uh, in terms of in terms of initiatives taken by Barclays, um, uh, on the back of some challenges, as you mentioned, um, we took a quite a holistic approach. We um, uh, we completely said that we would align all of our financing activities uh, to Paris. Um, uh, that we uh, we uh, committed to uh, to the ambition of being net zero by 2050. Uh, we committed to uh, extending over 100 billion pounds of green financing uh, by uh, by uh, 2030. But I think perhaps even ultimately more relevant, um, we committed ourselves to uh, almost on an annual basis um, uh, set out targets. Um, um, uh, that will measure the progress of Barclays on this uh, journey in terms of in terms of our role um, uh, um, in helping uh, the challenges around climate. Um, along that line, we took the the step um, really in some ways a first for the bank, where um, um, uh, we are going to go periodically. To our shareholders um, uh, at our annual meetings, um, and give them what we call a say on climate. Uh, I we will lay out the progress and the targets that we've made, and then basically uh, put as a resolution: um, um, you know, are our shareholders supportive of the progress that we're making? Uh, give them, if you will, a say in measuring the um, uh, the direction that Barclays. Uh, is on the, the aspirations that we've made, uh, whether we are accomplishing what we've set out to do uh, at a, uh, on a sufficient scale and, and sufficient speed. Um, um, no, I think it's very important, all of us as major public companies that we, um, or societies in Joe's case, that we connect with, uh, with our shareholders uh, or, or members of our society and uh, and embrace them as they accept or make recommendations as to what we do as we uh, march along this journey with respect to climate. So, say on climate is going to be a, a major initiative uh, by the bank. Um, uh, that initiative's gotten already quite a good response from um, from our our shareholders in alignment with our shareholders. 
I think is very important uh, as as Barclays fulfills its commitment. Yeah. Um, excellent. Um, and you know, Jess, uh, the the framework you outlined uh, in terms of uh, the 2050 target, uh, the interim targets, the annual reporting, uh, the sector specific strategies. Um, that's going to sound familiar to all the members of GFANS because that's effectively uh, what the uh, what the commitments uh, that we brought into uh, in GFANS, and that's one of the reasons why it's the you know it's viewed by the official sector and I, I think broader stakeholders as the gold standard for uh, for these types of uh, these types of commitments and that's how we can track progress it also concentrates the mind of course uh, because it reveals some of the things that we have been talking about which is what's missing what's required how can we move uh, how can we move faster um, and you know we have, a, we have about 10 minutes left so what I what I propose is uh, we move to what else uh, you know what more uh, can uh, uh, the industry, the financial industry, do to help drive uh, faster change uh, in the economy, in the real economy, meaningful change. Um, and, and I'm going to ask a, just sort of an open question and go to each of you, and I'll, I'll go just in the same order as I did at the start. So I'm sorry, Jess, that that means that if, if hopefully they don't take all your ideas up front, because I'm going to ask uh, what what you know what is um, what's the one thing uh, if you could identify something that's missing. Uh, at present, uh, or underappreciated, or underemphasized, uh, that uh, what's the one thing that would allow the financial sector to uh, help accelerate this transition uh, to net zero and unlock the necessary finance? And is you know, is there something the official sector can do? Are there things we can do together uh, uh, in terms of uh, in terms of moving this forward? And uh, Joe, can I uh, can I give you the floor first? Sure, thank you. Uh, well, sticking with housing, the the one thing would be a long-term credible policy framework that supports the retrofitting of housing in the UK. Um, you know, it, that's the thing that's just not there today. And if you're looking to retrofit a home today, the market is fragmented, it's subscale, it's confusing, um, and there's a massive opportunity there because a whole industry needs to grow up around this, a whole supply chain that doesn't exist today needs to come into an existence. And we've seen a few false starts in this area previously and, and, and changes and so on. So now is the time we've really got to put together a long-term credible policy framework. And I think we and others in the private sector can absolutely help in doing that. Um, but that I think needs to be the bedrock of what can become a thriving industry in the UK over the coming years. Excellent, thank you, Joe. Uh, Alison? Um, well, I'm I'm going to say there's not one one thing um, because if there was one thing and um, it would make it easy and we would all do it. But I think at the heart of this is collaboration um, and uh, transparency is going to be absolutely key to make this work. There's no lack of desire either from the customer base in terms of making the transition um, or the finance parties that you can you can hear around this table. So for me, I think clarity and guidance is clear. There are going to be national targets and global targets. And I think government um, have to be really clear in providing guidance and transparency on how national targets are going to be met and what support they're going to put in place to enable that to happen. To Joe's point, the housing sector is not going to transition without coordination. I think sectors need to have clear guidance around how they are going to move and what transition they're going to be making because they're not going to start from the same position. And then businesses need to know where they're able to go to get support and funding and financing to enable that transition. And I think it is the combination of that supported by consistent data. And you made the point at the start, Mark, we don't have all of the data and we don't have consistent standards, which is why it's so important to do that. But the more we can get that collaboration across those dimensions and clarity of the targets and the transition and how to get there, then the faster we'll be able to hit the targets. Excellent. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Alison. Uh, yeah, I know it's an unfair question to say one thing because the reality of uh, the scale of the task is it takes many things but uh, uh, and so you're allowed to uh, you're allowed to have more than one as you did uh, and Bill you have many things so uh, I'll, I'll give you the floor so well, I, I actually was I would like to pick up on, on some of what Allison said I think we all recognize that that banks uh, are often put in the position of being enforcers for uh, for the objectives of policymakers uh, and, and civil society broadly. 
uh, it's been that that way in compliance and financial crime compliance for a long time, uh, and I think it will be that way in uh, in carbon related or emissions related compliance as well. Uh, not that there won't be pressure put directly on power producers or or on sovereign states through various processes, whether it's it's UN related or uh, or regulator initiated, uh, but we know that that an important part of of this transition to to net zero is is going to be with uh, banks offering some uh, hopefully objective assessment of whether uh, whether our clients are are complying with the undertakings that they've made and of course starting with making the undertakings basically so that the the one ask or the, the one thing that we could really use is uh, and this is i think is picking up an allison's point is consistency of data uh we're going through an exercise now uh, as we as we've said publicly that uh, we will we will publish our net zero transition plan in october and we'll put that to a shareholder advisory vote in may of next year the, the 2022 agm it is a massive undertaking to, to 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 form views on what's what's appropriate in terms of the uh, of the, the the proportion of our clients' emissions that we take responsibility for. Uh, but we can only uh, have have any valuable input uh, or output on that one if we if we have decent data coming in in the first place. And right now we don't, especially in the developing markets, but even in developed markets. So, uh, and Mark, I know this is this is near and dear to your heart, uh, but from your your initiation of TCFD. Uh, but that that would be my 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 the one ask would be to to uh, really redouble efforts to get a consistent data set that that we can all work from so that we can implement these plans that we, that we are all committing to. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Uh, Jess. One, you're right. I would echo uh, all the points made by Joe and Allison and Bill. I think what I may add is, uh, and it's a lot of what you're working on, Mark. Um, this is sort of a unique human endeavor. Uh, as someone said, to solve climate uh, is going to require a global solution because climate does not know or does not know uh, geographic boundaries or uh, or national borders. Um, and so it's going to be interesting that to solve the climate challenge that faces all of us uh, will require a level of collaboration, cooperation on a global scale that perhaps humanity has never seen. Uh, and uh, uh, so hopefully one of the... Uh, one of the additional benefits of, of arresting this climate challenge is we bring the global community together in a way uh, uh, which, uh, uh, which is encouraging for all of us and for the future. That's a great point. Uh, it is a great point. And it, it, you know, consistent with that is, uh, and we're seeing, we are seeing elements of it. Uh, you think about the membership of uh, Various task force, uh, whether it's a uh, uh, voluntary carbon markets, the membership of GFANS, the work that's being done on portfolio alignment, uh, the fact that within a few years, and I know you think, well, I don't know if you don't think this, but people might think that central bankers love to get together all the time. <laughs> the, the only people you can congregate with is the central bankers, other central bankers, uh, basically. But, uh, you know, from zero to 90 um, central banks and supervisors is part of the network for greening uh, financial system. And actually that translating into more consistent policy, more consistent scenarios, more, uh, you know, and, a, and I still think a proper open and iterative process with the experts in the financial sector to develop uh, crime, climate risk management. Um, these are learned behaviors, right? You get cooperation can breed cooperation. And, and Jess, you're absolutely right. The scale of what's needed in terms of cooperation and collaboration is, uh, is, uh, is remarkable. And that could, you know, we could solve the big issue, but it also can breed more. And that's, uh, uh, would uh, be a huge benefit. Look, I um, I had high expectations uh, for this panel. I've been looking forward to it uh, for a while, and uh, you've exceeded them uh, because um, uh, not just in terms of your personal and uh, and institutional commitments and what you're doing, but also in terms of the translation of uh, the objectives into uh, action uh, and highlighting uh, what else is uh, what else is needed. I, I just want to, in, in closing, uh, I want to just, if I may, just emphasize a couple of points that have come up. Um, and one of the points Joe made it uh, with respect to uh, climate policy, uh, Allison, also uh, more broadly on uh, on policy, and you've all touched on in various ways. Uh, it is it is absolutely critical that we have credible and as much as possible, given political processes, predictable climate policy, whether it is around uh, home retrofits, whether it's around the future of the internal combustion engine, whether it's around a carbon price, whether it's around hydrogen fuel blends, whether it, you know, and on and on and on. 
And the more that that is understood by the policymakers and the more examples we have of that, uh, and, you know, it can be delayed delivery on a number of these things. Uh, it's a future carbon price. It's um, the end of internal combustion engines in 2030. It's a hydrogen blend or sustainable aviation fuel blend, which was something some were pushing for out of the, um, uh, the G7 uh, at, a, at a future date. Uh, that certainty pulls forward action. I mean, this group knows better than any, anybody that pull, pulls forward action, investment uh, and activity. Uh, and makes the solution that much easier. And I think one of the core points in terms of using GFAN's Net Zero Banking Alliance uh, conversations like this is to reinforce in tangible ways what can help unlock the investment that's needed. So that's the uh, that's the first point. The second is around um, data and being you know as clear and as granular as possible about what the specific data that is needed and what isn't needed and what is uh, you know, nice to have, but ultimately extraneous and, and, and lessening the burden of collecting that and focusing uh, the attention on the data that's uh, most relevant. We are making progress with the TCFD. I would, I would underscore, uh, you know, that that is being mapped and the UK has helped lead that. That is mapped uh, to being mandatory. That's one of the things that came out of the G7 summit. Uh, China, uh, uh, their announcement in recent weeks on the same uh, track, uh, the IFRS, uh, is moving forward with the Sustainable Standards Board and shaping those uh, in a way that um, um, works effectively as possible. I, I do also want to emphasize uh, one of Bill's points, one of many points uh, around not using the financial sector or the bank specifically as the enforcement mechanism. Uh, it is, it's always a temptation uh, to try to do the hard thing uh, uh, you know, uh, sort of under under the uh, away from uh, away from a political process or a policy process, and uh, use uh, regulation in a way that's inconsistent. I think what has shifted is that because of the types of commitments that you uh, individually and collectively have towards net zero, is that there is a system that's lining up and will show where there's progress and where there's gaps, and then that that reflects back into the policy process and others in terms of how those gaps can be filled. And some of those gaps are in markets, but some of those are directly uh, in uh, in policy. Um, so uh, just in closing, uh, I, I want to uh, thank you all uh, for uh, again for your leadership, uh, both uh, you know within the UK, but globally, uh, because it is helping uh, to shift uh, uh, the ambition and action uh, globally. And that's the city at its best. Uh, speaking of the city, I want to thank the City of London for uh, for hosting us uh, and for their leadership uh, on uh, these issues uh, through uh, Green Horizon Summit, uh, uh, the work of the, uh, the Green Finance Institute. And uh, in, in that last regard, I think my last responsibility is to hand over uh, to the chair, the president of the Green uh, Finance Institute, uh, Rand Marie uh, Thomas. So thank you all. And uh, Rand Marie, uh, the floor is yours.